Hi, I'm Connie Arzigian, and I'm working with the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. And I want to talk to you today about some of the ways that archaeologists can tell whether something that we find out in the ground was made by humans or is it natural. And people will bring us in materials all the time and ask us, what is this? And sometimes it's pretty easy to tell. This is a nice axe. It's pretty clearly made by humans. But there are other kinds of materials that people will bring in that they're not sure. How was this formed? Did a person do this? Did nature form it? There are all sorts of different kinds of stones, the way that they are formed, that humans may have made them, that nature may have made them. So we're going to take a look at lots of different kinds of materials to see, is this a humanly made pendant? Is it a naturally made pendant? How are some of these things shaped? How can we learn about them? So that you'll have some ideas when you find something out in nature, was it made by humans? Is it just a natural stone? Here we have a collection of celts and axes and a little axe preform and something that has been worked a little bit more lightly and then a natural stone. So what do archaeologists look for when we're looking at things to see what is actually an axe or a celt and what was just a natural stone? Well, this first celt here gives us a good clue. It's a very polished surface at the end. This is where it was cutting into the tree and it got polished through use. So there's a high sheen on here. So it's actually polished smooth on both surfaces. Um, this edge here um, is a little bit shallower, so it probably reflects how far they were digging into the wood on this surface. And then in the middle, it was shaped by taking one stone and pecking it into the surface, so this surface is very rough. So we've got a very distinct difference. On the side, it was probably hafted, so the surface here is very polished again. And on the back, again, a rough pecked surface that hasn't yet been polished from use as it is on the end. So if I run my finger from one end to the other, I get a very different experience across the way. Lots of differences because it's reflecting use over here and manufacture over here. If I look at this axe, it again has a polished surface. We can see some of the sheen coming in from this area here where it was polished. Now they resharpened this end, so they took more chips out of this to try to refresh the end, but the center part here still retains some of that polish. And then we have an area in the middle that is much darker and much smoother. This is where it was hafted, so they would have bound rawhide or something across the middle of this. It's very smooth and it's very, uh, in many cases it'll be a little bit darker because of all of the organics um, that were tied to it for so many years. The end of this will again get rougher where it was being shaped, but there wasn't anything happening to it. And then at the very end, it might be pecked again. There might be a lot of pecking where they were shaping the corner or where they were using this as a hammer. This one is beginning to be an ax. So it's a stone, but it has some pecking on one end. And you can see that they took a chip out of it. So the pecking is very rough. The natural stone is smoother. It's not the polish of the other stones, but it's kind of smoother. And then there's pecked areas on each side where they're trying to shape the stone. This one is a celt. It's hard to see it, but it's easy to feel when I'm running my finger from one end to the other. It's rough, it's kind of pecked, and then right here it gets very smooth. So this is where they were using it. And if I look at the other side, we can see that again, there's some polish coming across the worked end, and then it gets much rougher over here. So looking to see how it differs from stone end to end is one way that we can tell. And the natural stone is kind of smooth all over. They didn't take chips out of it. They didn't do pecking on it. They didn't shape it in any way. It's, polished. it's possible that the whole stone could get highly polished from use, but then it'll really look like it's been shaped to do something. The natural stone is going to have a uniform feel across the whole surface. Even this stone that looks kind of natural has a very distinct polish across the end that's very different from the rest of it, showing that this was deliberately shaped. We have here a set of examples of grooves in stones, and these are often tricky to interpret. So this first one is an axe, 
it's very clearly a humanly made tool. It's got a large groove that was ground in here to haft it. Then we have here a series of what we would call net sinkers. These are stones that have a groove pecked in them, probably to tie a rope around them to use them literally to sink a net. Um, sometimes they're pecked to shape them on the side and you can see here there's a little bit of pecking but most of the stone is natural and the net stone doesn't really need to have a whole lot done to it so this stone is basically just the groove that is cut around here and the rest of the stone is natural they found a stone that worked for what they wanted they pecked a groove in it and they went from there but this groove feels different from the rest of the stone. The bottom of the groove is very polished. On the edges, I can still feel the pecking where they were working it. And then the rest of the stone kind of feels natural. This one was very heavily shaped. They probably shaped the whole thing. There's a groove around the middle and they may have pecked the outer surface for all of these. Uh, so this might have been, uh, they needed a smaller one or for whatever reason. But again, a deliberately pecked surface that uh, is different from the rest of the stone. We also have some stones that have interesting groups in them, but are probably natural. And I show you this one, which has what is probably a vein of harder material running right through the middle of the stone. So the rest of the stone has weathered out off of it and has left this vein. So we have this vein running through the stone and it looks like it was maybe a deliberately uh, carved stone. It probably wasn't deliberately carved although there might be a little spot here that they might have pecked. The reason we would call this an artifact isn't because necessarily of the way it's shaped, but because it was found in an archeological feature at an archeological site. So this was found with other artifacts that were clearly cultural. And so this stone might've had a purpose for it beyond what it was. It might've been shaped, it might've been a natural stone, but it's context. Context is critical here. It's context in a cultural feature said that somebody found this, picked it up and used it. These other stones here are natural and they were not found in a cultural context. They were found along the lake shore. And you can see that they have areas where there were layers. This is a stone that's got a lot of sedimentary layers, a lot of different places where there's differential erosion and the stones are just kind of weathering like that. And if you look at this one, this very complex collection of areas with irregularities. These are all kind of weathering out differently. These were not found in a feature. These were not found at an archeological site. So they have no signs that they were actually used by people. If they had been found in context in a pit of some sort or on an archeological site, maybe somebody had picked them up. So that's when we ask people, where did you find this? If they say, I found it on the lake shore, it might just be natural. If they say, I found it with all sorts of other stuff, such as this and this and this, and then maybe it's cultural. So not all stones have to have been worked to be important, but where they were found is key. Here we have a collection of stones that were shaped and pecked in using as hammer stones, uh, knocking off flakes from them, and then natural stones. So if we look at this first one, we would call this a mono. It's got a surface that is polished on the one top because this is where they're using it to grind against the matade, to grind up their corn. The outer edges are pecked and nicely shaped into a sphere. And you can see the difference between the polished surface and the pecked edge. The bottom has a few spots where it's been pecked, and I'll talk about that with our next stone. Oops. This one is also a mono, probably, but it's got, again, pecking around the outsides and a ground surface, but it has several places where we've got pecking on one surface. We've got little dimples knocked into it. And this may be where they were using it to put nuts or something else to crack. Uh, a little bit of depression on the stone will help you to hold the nut there so that you can crack it and it doesn't roll away. But the pecking on the outside is consistent for this particular tool. 
This is a hammerstone. I know it's a hammerstone because we used it as a hammerstone. It has pecking on several ends where it was used to knock flakes off of another stone. So lots of very rough surface in these particular spots, uh, smooth natural stone elsewhere, and then there's a place where we actually knocked a flake off from where we're using it. Uh, but the pecking on this surface is what would be distinctive for this particular tool. This is mostly a natural stone, but it's got flakes taken off of several of the edges. They bashed this top repeatedly to try to knock some of these flakes off. And we're not sure why. It doesn't look like they could really have made this into much, which may be why they abandoned it. But it's got a lot of battering at this end, and it's got battering over here. And otherwise, it's kind of a natural stone. So uh, what were they doing with this? They were working it in some fashion. We don't know how. But the evidence of the working is all of these flakes that are taken off of the top. And this stone is natural. It's got a smooth surface all over. There are dimples around it, but they're not from pecking because these dimples go inside the stone. They're just a little bit of evidence of differential erosion, uh, little spots where it's a little bit softer, so it eroded there. Uh, but the whole surface feels very uniform, and the broken surface also feels very uniform. No flakes were taken off of that. So smooth stone, natural stone. This is our classic mono and metate for grinding stones. And the mono has a flat surface for grinding. And then the metate is a big stone that again has a smooth ground surface. So this inner surface that's been ground away as they're using it. Uh, the outer surface might be natural or it might be pecked and shaped, but the inner surface will feel very distinctly smoother. And there are places where it's a little bit irregular, but the higher surfaces have this high polish. They're, they're polished smooth because of the grinding activity uh, by grinding the corn. So uh, sometimes we'll find just fragments of these, but we can always recognize them by this polished surface on one side versus kind of rough or natural on the others. Here we have objects that have grooves cut in them, either deep grooves, we'd call this an abrader. This might be a, some sort of a stone that has, it might be a sharpening stone, or they might be deliberately etching something into the surface. And this is a natural stone um, that eroded this way. So if we start with this abrader, it, this would have been often part of a much longer stone. This is sandstone, and it has a groove that has been worn down in the middle. It's smooth on the bottom. It's straight, because what they're doing is they're putting their arrow shaft into here and grinding it back and forth, so it's serving as sandstone. But this is a perfectly straight surface, because you're working as an arrow shaft. You really want to have a straight, smooth surface in there to work your arrow shaft down to be usable. Comparing that to this natural sandstone, we have a series of layers in the sandstone of probably different iron enriched materials that are much harder, and then the sandstone in between it, and the iron enriched materials are leaving denser layers that are eroding out differently, but these grooves are very irregular. They're not straight, they're not smooth on the bottom, and if I were to try to use this to, to polish my arrow shaft, it would be a pretty rough surface. It wouldn't be the straight line that I want to have if I'm actually working my stone tool. This one in the middle is interesting because it's got very thin lines. This wasn't used as an abrader, but it may have been used either as a sharpening stone, or these might have been deliberate lines etched into here. So we probably have a series of lines that went this way first, and then other lines that went this way. And they're not deeply etched into there, but they're definitely deliberate because if we compare them to the natural surface, we have just a rough surface with no lines in it. The natural layers 
are not going perpendicular. There are horizontal layers that could be breaking, but these lines carved into it at the top. So this might be a sharpening stone. You might take um, one of your knives and sharpen against it, or this might have been a part of something that they were actually etching. This is a natural iron concretion. It's a formation from the soil where iron concentrates and then some of the materials around it erode away, leaving these little nodules. But what's interesting about this one is that if you look inside it, it's got a black pigment. It's got material that looks like it was ground inside. So maybe they were using this as some sort of a paint pot. So the inside has streaks of a black residue for it that marks this as not only having been used, but having been cultural. And it was found on an archaeological site in a cultural feature, so we know that it was being used by people for something. So this is an example of a naturally fractured stone. This is a frost fracture. And you can see in the stone, there are many fracture lines forming and one of those formed and knocked off this top part. And it's a very distinctive fracture with this kind of concave surface on the material and then the piece that it came off of has just a distinctive fracture that we recognize as frost fracture from these stones. So here is a collection of stones that have interesting depressions in them. And most of the ones in this collection here are natural. Many of them are called Omar stones that were formed because there were softer materials in the stone that eroded away, leaving these holes. How can we tell that these are natural holes rather than something that somebody ground down and used? Well, if we look inside, and this big one is a good example, we've got lots of protuberances. We've got lots of bumps and sharp bits in here that stayed when the softer material eroded. If this had been used as a grinding stone, all of those rough bits would have been ground away. So having all of those natural bumps and ridges in here tells us that that's a natural stone. We'll also find some of these stones that have very deep depressions that, out, that has an overhang. So you can see here this depression actually undercut on all sides and somebody using this and drilling with it would not have been able to get that shape. They would not have been able to drill underneath this overhang, but a naturally eroding surface would be able to produce that. So these are places where there are soft, sometimes calcareous materials, calcium deposits in the stone that over the millions of years eroded out, leaving these kinds of depressions in the stone. So they're very common in certain areas but um, they're natural stones. We also have some examples of stones that might have holes that these may have been a result of fossil worms or other kinds of fossils that were in the stone that have eroded out, leaving just the stone. In this case, we can see the holes that go through the stone, but we can also see here a cross section through one of those. Uh, so these also have an irregular rough surface where the other material eroded out, leaving the depressions. But we also have places where humans drilled holes. And this is a little pendant that shows a hole that was drilled by Native Americans in the past. And one of the ways we can recognize that is that the drill holes are larger at the outside and they kind of taper towards the middle. Because when you're using a stone drill, it's not going perfectly straight through. You're really working it and you will end up working it from one side and then turning around and working it from the other and meeting in the middle. So the outside parts kind of taper to a narrow point in the middle and there are actually, you can see ridges on the inside where there was grinding, where there was scraping. But those lines are not gonna be perfectly circular because the stone tool is not gonna be a perfectly circular, rapid movement material like a modern saw. That kind of modern drill is what formed this top hole here. 
and if you were to look inside this hole, you would see concentric rings that were made by a modern drill, drilling a hole through the stone. So we'll often see these in uh, tourist shops as pretty stones with a hole drilled at the top in order to make them into a fun stone to hang from a necklace. So here we have a drilled hole at the top and some natural holes that formed on the bottom. So the key to these is to looking in the inside of the hole to see what kind of drill marks are on there. And steel drills will leave a very different pattern from a native hole done by a stone drill or from Mother Nature eroding a hole. Sometimes we find stones that are smooth and polished, but don't have any obvious signs that somebody picked it up and used it. This polish could have come from rolling in the river, but it was found with other cultural materials in a pit on an archeological site. So it seems that somebody was using it or picking it up and had a purpose for it. And we don't know what that purpose was, but it's possible that these kinds of stones were used as polishing stones. We've done experiments making pottery, and we know that a smooth stone like this would have been useful to smooth the surface of the clay before firing it. Is that what this was for? We can't tell. But because it was found at an archaeological site in a feature, we can infer that it was used for something, or at least it had been collected to possibly be used for something. If it was just found on the lake shore or in the river, it might just be a stone. Now you have some idea how to tell natural from cultural stones. What happens if you find something? What happens if you happen to find this ax laying on the ground somewhere? It's clearly humanly made. What do you do with it? If you look at the MBAC stewardship page, and there will be a link in the bottom in the description box, it'll tell you how to record where you found it. We talked about how important context is. Where were these things found? And so you would keep a record of where it was found. You can get a Google Earth map and put a dot on it. You can get any sort of a map and keep a record of where these things were found. And then you, if you want to share your information with an archaeologist, the MVAC page also has information on how to contact us to tell us where you found something. We can look and see if there's in the site reported from there, or we can report a site. We report many sites each year based on the results of people that bring us really interesting artifacts that they found out in the world. So once you have this material, it's an important part. If you have a cultural material, if you have artifacts from the past, these are an important part of the archaeological record, and we'll provide you information on our website on how to keep track of these materials and how to protect them for the future.